He has served as a board member on the Executive Council of the American Geriatric Society for several years and is currently the secretary. He's also associate editor of the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. Relevant to today's topic, Wayne has been a provider at the Madison Clinic, Harborview's Clinic for People with HIV, for 25 years. Since 1992, he has been the medical director of Bailey Boucher House, primarily an AIDS long-term care facility and day health center, caring for hundreds of patients with AIDS and cancer every year. I know Wayne as a fantastic educator of medical students, residents, and fellows in geriatrics and palliative care, as well as a role model and advocate for junior faculty. Please welcome Wayne McCormick. Thanks, Susan, and thank you all for coming today. I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been interested in for quite a while, the intersection between longstanding HIV infection and aging. I, I am in the geriatric division, but my practice perhaps resembles a general internist more than a geriatrician in that I have had a, a HIV panel for a long time. So I'll reflect on that over the arc of the epidemic during the talk today. And, and the underpinnings of uh, the discussion this morning are going to be some work that's accrued over the past three years. Since about the turn of the decade in 2010, uh, a number of people got interested in this uh, interaction between HIV and aging uh, uh, on a national basis. And a panel was formed uh, via the congruence of these three organizations, the American Geriatric Society, uh, the American Academy of HIV, HIV Medicine, which was actually the main organization starting this initiative in ACREA, the AIDS Community Research Initiative of America. And you see a lot of UW people uh, on the list here. These are the participants in this consensus panel to come up with uh, areas of interest and recommendations or treatment strategies for managing older people with HIV infection. John Applebaum, who's an, uh, on the board of uh, AAHIVM, who's a medical educator at the University of South Florida and an HIV provider and a geriatrician, and I co-chaired this consensus panel. And you see a number of people below, both from UW, California, and the East Coast, who participated either as authors of sections of the document I'll refer to, uh, on the panel or as reviewers of the document. So I'll come back to that, but well, basically the, everything I present this morning came out of this consensus panel activity over the past few years. Like we usually do, let's, let's start with a case. This is a patient who uh, I and several other Madison Clinic providers have cared for over the past couple of decades. He's uh, 60 and has, HIV, has had HIV for about uh, 24 years, at least a couple of decades. Uh, and as a result of his HIV infection, has had a couple of opportunistic illnesses, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple episodes of community-acquired pneumonia for which he was hospitalized. But he's also accrued a substantial number of illnesses that could affect anybody uh, of any age, but also as they age. Uh, he's had long-standing depression, for which he's also been hospitalized in the past, atrial fibrillation, obstructive sleep apnea, and hyperlipidemia, hypothyroidism, hypertension, uh, diabetes type 2, obesity, and he's been a smoker uh, for quite a while. I've listed his medicines down below, and you see that it's a fairly long list. It's uh, over a dozen prescription medications, many of which you'd wouldn't be surprised to see uh, in one of your clinic patients who's a little bit older. And then, of course, his HIV regimen down below. Uh, lots of pills. Uh, early in the epidemic, we were always worried about pill burden in people with HIV. Now it's coming to the fore again. We're worried about people taking so many medicines and keeping them straight. With, with great pride, we've been able to uh, amalgamate HIV medicines into single pills. So the the three medicines on, the, on your lower right are actually one pill taken once a day, known as a tripla. But, uh, but in any case, there's still an awful lot of pills. His, his pills associated with his other diseases have crept up to add to a fairly um, complicated medical regimen. 
Uh, this, uh, this is going back a couple of years, but at, uh, at the time seeing him around 2010, he Weighed 220 pounds. He's about five feet seven, so his BMI is pretty high. But on exam, his lungs were clear. He had atrial fibrillation then, uh, with a good ventricular response of 88. He was fairly obese, and his body had changed over time due to antiretroviral therapy with lipodystrophy. Um, his CD4 count was 177, not as high as we'd like to see. We'd when, when people have a good antiretroviral response, we'd like to see the CD4 count, CD4 count well above 200, but his had never gotten quite that high. But he had uh, had an undetectable viral load for quite a while, so a tribute to the effectiveness of his antiretroviral regimen. But he was diabetic, not well controlled. His fasting sugar was 280, his A1C 9.2, TSH was okay, and he was hyperlipidemic. His cholesterol was 280 and his LDL was high as well. So we engaged in a discussion where we were recommending statin medications and insulin therapy for his diabetes. Well, he was not, he was kind of a needle phobic fellow, so he's not interested in starting insulin. And uh, he was willing to consider a statin medication. And it was a little bit difficult thinking about adding a statin to his regimen uh, because of drug-drug interactions. But rosuvastatin uh, was a good choice for him. Unfortunately, even after starting this medicine, his depression had crept up again on him, and he'd become more and more dep depressed, even on therapy, and had gained quite a bit of weight. And his lipid panel now shows a very high cholesterol, a dangerously high triglyceride level, and his A1C still way out of whack. So he, he was not interested in hospitalization or anything of the sort. We'll, we're fortunate in Madison Clinic that we have a really good interdisciplinary team. There's psychiatry who are excellent right there in clinic, excellent pharmacists who understand uh, multiple medications, drug-drug interactions, but particularly between antiretroviral therapy and other medicines, great uh, case managers and social work support. So they came to the fore and helped work with this fellow on his depression and on his medical regimen. And he was a, a fairly motivated individual who was interested in alternative therapies. He uh, visited Bastyr Institute, got involved with them, and began a, not quite a full vegan diet and engaged in exercises, walking an hour or two per day. And over the next five months, actually lost 44 pounds. His uh, Glucose came into good range, as did his A1C. Triglycerides came down, still a little high, but much better. Cholesterol and LDL, much better. Still on his rosuvastatin, but uh, also on this kind of vegan and exercise regimen. He was still smoking, but rarely, maybe one cigarette a week or so. So it's kind of interesting how he responded so well to this lifestyle intervention, even though he was on statin therapy and uh, and doing these other things. Uh, so it makes you wonder, well, now what was the main factor in this very dangerous hyperlipidemia and his diabetes being out of whack? Was it his you know, weight gain and body habitus, his genetics? Was it uh, antiretroviral therapy? Uh, you know, his depression, what was it? Well, probably all those things. Probably very difficult to disentangle, but that's the crux of what I'm be talking about today is the difficulty of disentangling all the factors that go into somebody who's aging with HIV and is accruing lots of uh, conditions that we normally associate with aging. So let me come back to the methods of our consensus panel so you see a little bit of the grounding of what I'm going to present today. There were 16 panel members on this consensus panel that began interacting with each other in late 2010. Half geriatricians and half HIV specialists. And on both sides of the coin, people who had other interests, like my interest in preventive medicine and end-of-life care, palliative medicine, but there were oncologists and nephrologists and uh, psychiatrists, neurologists, on both sides, who were yeah, geriatricians or HIV specialists or both, with lots of overlap between the two. And what we did is we engaged in an iterative modified Delphi technique where we 
came up with areas of importance or interest in thinking about caring for older people with HIV, winnowed that list down to the areas that were most important, and then the panel members took on uh, one or two topics and uh, built text supporting uh, our thoughts about it. And we created a document that's about 80 pages long, and I'll give you reference to it at the end, but I've made some handouts of the summary of our activities, which was both published in uh, the American Geriatric Society Journal and the AAHIVM Journal, but also in an in a NIH guideline. So I've made hard copies of those for you here, and there should be a stack over at Harborview as well. Uh, after about a year and a half of that work, we had a uh, gathering of the consensus panel in Washington, D.C., followed by a White House conference on HIV and aging there. We had great support from the three uh, sponsoring organizations. Then after that was finished and the document was created, then six more reviewers who had not been part of the original 16, half geriatricians and half HIV specialists, reviewed the overall document for face validity. So that, at the end of that process, well into 2012, that's what you see the results of before you and what I'm going to tell you about this morning. So the near-term objectives of the talk this morning is to review current knowledge about HIV in older patients. We're going to talk about aging phenomena, period, and also aging phenomena in the context of longstanding HIV infection. We'll talk about a lot of non, what were considered non-AIDS related conditions, like the case I presented. Was his diabetes a result of his HIV or his antiretroviral therapy? Well, maybe a little bit the latter, but, you know, a lot of other factors going on too. But that's when I, that kind of thing is what I mean when I talk about non-AIDS health related conditions in older patients with HIV. We'll talk about some psychosocial issues that are probably important and impact caring for older people with HIV infection, all in the context of our consensus panel. Well, it's, it's certainly uh, likely the case that if you have HIV infection, even if it's well controlled on antiretroviral therapy, for a couple of decades, that does something to you that's probably not healthy. Uh, Here's some pictures that are re reprinted from a New York Magazine article a few years ago, just sh showing the faces of older people with HIV and showing the changes in the way their bodies look. Uh, it's, it's the case that a substantial number of people who've had HIV infection for a long time, even with good control of their viral load on antiretroviral therapy, approve things like subtle cognitive changes, short-term memory loss, or in some cases, uh, frank dementia, even with good control of their viral load. Their body changes in ways that are uh, unusual and unpleasant to them. Uh, many get osteoporosis, many get avascular necrosis. A couple of these individuals have had bilateral hip replacements. Uh, so lots of things accrue, even with good control of the infection, that are untoward, that go along with aging to some extent and long-standing HIV and antiretroviral therapy. Here's a, uh, a chart of the current prevalence of uh, HIV infection in the U.S. And this was, uh, this was a paper that just appeared a few months ago from work uh, using the North American AIDS Cohort Collaboration on Research and Design, in other words, known as NA Accord, that a lot of UW uh, uh, researchers use, like Mari Kitahata and Heidi Crane and others. This particular paper was about trends in antiretroviral use, but I wanted to reprint it so you could see the changes and where most of the people with HIV infection ages occur right now. And there's kind of this bulge right now in the mid 40s. Uh, and over time, probably by the end of this decade, most people with HIV infection in the United States, and in Western Europe for that matter, are going to be age 50 or older. Uh, so this is kind of a moving wave of patients. Here's, here's a, just a pictorial reflection of that from a few years ago, showing this wave of people moving forward in time 
Right now, my comments are going to have to do with people around in here. The patient I presented to you was 60 a few years ago. But there's this coming wage wave of people that at the end of this decade and next decade are going to be 50 or 60 or 70 years old. And there's some of those patients now, but just not a whole lot of them. But we're noticing things in those patients that's going to pertain to this wave of the future that will arrive in our clinics the next decade. So let's spend a few minutes talking about what happens among older people taking antiretroviral therapy for a long time. We'll talk about virologic suppression, you know, suppressing the viral load, which is one of our main goals of antiretroviral therapy, the subsequent immunologic response, the increase in CD4 count that we hope for when we start antiretroviral therapy in people, and how that affects mortality in different age groups. Well, let's start with the good news first. It turns out that older people actually have better viral load suppression than younger people. And we can, we can postulate why that might be. But the fact is, is that older people just, just do better. They're better able to suppress their viral load on antiretroviral therapy than younger people. This top line here is people age 60 or over with HIV infection. And after two years of therapy, a little over 80% of them have suppressed their viral load to undetectable, which is great. And the younger age groups uh, fall behind, not quite as good at suppressing their viral load. Now, that's probably because older people are a little bit better at taking their antiretroviral medication regularly than younger people. But you might ask, well, why is that? Just because they're old? Uh, there must be some underpinnings. So that's kind of an interesting research question is, why are they? Uh, is it because they're more adherent? And if so, how come? Uh, is it because they're in their 60s and were alive and aware before antiretroviral thera therapy came up? So they kind of have the, the, the fear of untreated AIDS and uh, as a result take their medicine a little bit better? I would say it might be interesting to find, find out. But in any case, they do better, and it doesn't really depend on the base of the regimen, whether they're taking protease inhibitors as the basis for their antiretroviral regimen or non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. E either way, they do a better job uh, of suppressing their viral load over time than younger people. So the top line here is also the age 60 and older. Unfortunately, that does not result in the bump in CD4 count among older people uh, that we'd like to see. Uh, even though they suppress their viral load, the CD4 count does not rise as high as in younger people uh, on average. Here, the bottom line you see is those age 60 or over. So they do not get the same reconstitution phenomena. Uh, I'm not talking about iris here, or immune reconstitution syndrome. I'm talking about just reconstitution of their CD4 count and their immunologic response. Not quite as good in older people as in younger people. And that also does not depend on the underpinning of the regimen, whether it's boosted protease inhibitors or non-nukes, they, they still bring up the rear. Uh, so the bottom line here, again, is those age 60 or older. So, I mean, well, that's peculiar. How, how come they don't have a rise in CD4 count if their viral load suppressed so much better than in younger individuals? Well, in a word, that's because of immunosenescence. This is a phenomenon that just occurs in aging, period, but it's amplified in HIV infection. The next couple of slides I'm going to show you are actually just in non-infected people. So these next two slides are people who do not have HIV infection. These are just changes that occur in CD, in CD counts uh, with age. Uh, so this pertains to the CD4 and CD8 clusters of differentiation. That's what the CD stands for, clusters or compartments of differentiation. And in both CD4 and CD8 counts, they fall with age. So these green bars you see here are people between age 60 and 80. The red bars between 20 and 40. Just over time, with aging, our, our uh, T cell subsets are reduced. And this pertains particularly to the naive T cells. So these are the ones that you depend on for reconstitution. And the same thing uh, pertains to uh, uh, the other compartments, but in particular, 
The converse of losing your naive T cells is that you have more senescent T cells, more cells that are uh, terminally or, or maturely differentiated. They've already responded to infection and they lose their CD28 expression. So there's a drop in both compartments simply with age. And that manifests itself in a number of different uh, immune phenomena with aging. So older people don't respond to influenza vaccine uh, as well as younger people because they've, they've increased their CD28 or terminally differentiated T cells. There's less naive cells to respond. So this, this particular slide shows that the odds of responding to influenza vaccine are lower when people have more terminally differentiated uh, T cells in, this, in the CD8 uh, uh, compartment in particular, but that goes for lots of different uh, immune stimuli like a PPD or any kind of skin test, just the response to that's reduced as we get older. So aging reduces T cell diversity. The, the T cell uh, spectrum becomes more homogeneous, uh, more differentiated, less naive T cells over time. So, and that's all bundled into this phenomenon of immunosenescence. Uh, there's increased population of terminally differentiated T cells, less naive T cells that, that could potentially respond during immune reconstitution. But in, at least in the setting of HIV infection, there's, there's, there's this chronic T cell activation. This, there's an ongoing immunologic stimulus because the HIV isn't gone. It might be suppressed, but it's still there. Uh, and so there's ongoing response, ongoing uh, inflammatory markers present, uh, and a general thymic insufficiency or uh, lack of fortitude. And these are all accelerated in HIV. Now, in HIV, the CD4 uh, cluster is more effective because after all that's the target of the virus. You can see how that kind of synergy might uh, get together to really harm the immune system as people age with HIV, as they're getting older, the natural consequences of what happens to your immune system accrues and then there's the long-standing HIV infection as well. So a bad combination of factors leading to this lack of response that I've showed you in the, in the previous slides. There's it's kind of multiple vicious cycles getting together with this kind of low level viral rep replication, even with a good viral load suppression, thymic insufficiency. So there's these suboptimal CD4 gains. This is ongoing residual inflammation in immunosenescence, which leads to a number of AIDS related phenomena and also non AIDS events, lots of morbidity. So we're going to talk about that now, but as a result, the mortality is simply higher in older people with HIV. So the bottom curve here is the mortality accrued after AIDS diagnosis among those age 55 or older. 55 isn't that old, right? I mean, it's lots of people in this room like me, over 55. But in, if you have had HIV infection for a couple of decades, it, it portends a difference. I, I don't want to assert that there's aging acceleration, that a younger person with HIV is just like an older person without HIV. I think that's a simplistic uh, approach to this. But the fact is that long-standing HIV infection and aging do seem to accelerate a number of phenomena that have to do with aging generally. So here's a little summary, a little sub-summary so far. We think that adherence is better among older people than younger, as marked by their good, better suppression of HIV viral load. <clears throat> and it doesn't depend on the underpinning of the regimen. But the CD4 response is not as good. And consequently, the mortality is higher among older people than younger. So what, what, what's the cause of death of these older people with HIV? Well, it's usually not a direct but what we would usually link to HIV infection. In fact, uh, only about 10% currently of deaths in older people with HIV are actually what we consider an AIDS-related diagnosis, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or pneumocystis pneumonia or something like that. There are these other conditions that are usually on the death certificate. And it's usually not just one of them. It's some aggregate of a number of different conditions that lead to their mortality. It might be substance abuse or cardiovascular disease or stroke. 
cancers, some that we wouldn't necessarily associate with HIV infection directly, end-stage liver disease, perhaps from concurrent HCV infection, and any number of pulmonary or renal complications. So some aggregate of things, but 90% of death certificates currently in older people with HIV reflect these conditions, not something we'd necessarily directly associate with longstanding HIV infection. So let's talk about some of the comorbidities, and I'm going to introduce to you uh, kind of the geriatric side of this as we talk about comorbidities. There's any number of different comorbidities we're going to talk to talk about in older people with HIV, but I want you to start thinking about the aggregate of these conditions, like in the case I presented. That it's not just one thing, it's a number of things co-conspiring to harm the health of older people with HIV infection. Here's, here's just a chart, uh, a graphic of the different comorbidities among older people with HIV infection. And the square red boxes are people who are uh, age 65 or older. And you see that the incidence of comorbidities is, is high among older people with HIV. And a lot of these things aren't HIV related, like stroke, coronary artery disease, pulmonary embolism, osteoporosis, and they're kind of related to HIV or antiretroviral therapy, as I'll talk about, but kind of not. Anyway, lots of different comorbidities among older people with HIV. And as a geriatrician, I think about that a little bit differently. We're used to, when we admit somebody to the hospital or see them in clinic, there's their chief complaint or main present illness, and then a bunch of comorbidities that were sticked down in their past medical history. But in an older person, we tend to think about that in an aggregate way. And the term for that that's currently in vogue is multimorbidity. It's the co-occurrences of diseases and their functional consequences that lead to higher mortality and morbidity. Much more than you'd expect from the simple addition of all those ages. So it's the age, several serious conditions that might be ameliorated but can't really be cured by medical therapy, and their impact and function on cognition. So when we see people with multimorbidity in senior care clinic, geriatrics clinic, we, we think of it as, as a fairly dire thing. We, we think of it like somebody who, who's in their 80s who has, say, four different conditions like congestive heart failure, osteoarthritis, adult onset diabetes that's well controlled, type 2, uh, who also has functional decline or co and or cognitive decline. The survival curve of a person like that is roughly similar to uh, people with a number of advanced cancers. So things occur to us when we see somebody in senior care clinic with multimorbidity. We think about, well, gee, does this person have a durable power of attorney or have they got their advanced directive? We think about kind of palliative approaches as well as ameliorative approaches to their multiple illnesses. And that's because there's this nonlinear effect between well, conditions and comorbidities and the impact on function and mortality. Here's, here's the addition of diseases. Now, again, these are not necessarily HIV-infected people, but HIV is just another one of these conditions that can be ameliorated but not necessarily cured. The more diseases you add up, it, add up, it add ups, adds up to the decline in physical functioning in an exponential way, not a linear way. And the same thing pertains to mortality. The more diseases, the exponentially worsening of their uh, mortality. So the sum is worse than the parts, is what I'm telling you. And if one of these parts is HIV, it may be even more dire. So let's talk about some of the comorbidities and how they might add up. No surprise that the incidence of cancers, even with good antiretroviral control, is still higher for AIDS-related cancers uh, than people who are not HIV-infected. So for Kaposi's sarcoma, anal cancer, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, still an increased odds of getting those cancers even with good viral load suppression. But there's a bunch of other cancers that weren't at least originally considered related to HIV that also have a much higher incidence in people with HIV than in uninfected people, like lung cancer, melanoma, et cetera. Curiously, it doesn't pertain to breast and prostate cancer, at least so far. But anyway, the, the point is, there's just a lot of cancer in older people with HIV. 
some related to HIV, some may not be related, but it's great to have a lot of oncologic presence at Madison Clinic because it comes up a lot. There's a lot of cancer as a comorbidity, part of the morbidity burden among older people with HIV. And there's been a lot of work lately about the age of onset of these diseases, uh, thinking that people with HIV, long-standing HIV infection may acquire cancers earlier than uninfected people. And originally that seemed to be the case for quite a few of these different cancers. But as it turns out, uh, when you adjust for a number of other factors, it may be the case that the, the age of onset of cancers may not be that different among HIV infected people and uninfected people. But still what I said pertains. There's a lot of cancer that's dealt with in a clinic like Madison Clinic, both HIV related and presumably non-AIDS related. There's a lot of diabetes in uh, HIV clinic. Of course, diabetes is increasing among the general population, but it seems to be increasing a lot more in people with HIV infection that's long-standing. So these yellow bars here are people with HIV relative to the greenish bars that is the general population. Lots of diabetes, perhaps as a result of antiretroviral therapy, and perhaps as a result of any number of other factors. And that seems to be leading to more coronary artery disease. Uh, this, this was a study about coronary calcium, showing there's an unusual amount of coronary calcium in relatively younger people with HIV infection. Uh, and the assertion in this paper was that the vascular age of people with HIV was 15 years older than their actual age. But, but again, I, I'm not sure that I, I want to assert that HIV accelerates aging so much just to recognize that there's a substantial amount of vascular morbidity that's accruing in older people with HIV infection. And it's unclear why that is uh, right now. It, it, again, may have to do with some of the antiretroviral therapies. But right now, we think that the risk for cardiovascular disease in HIV is probably mostly associated with age, simply age. And the important things to do are to use good antiretroviral therapy and suppress the viral load and emphasize smoking cessation. It's, it, it's, we do knee-jerk and start a lot of statin therapy in our Madison Clinic patients. And, uh, and that's probably a good thing. I did it with this patient I presented to you, but it is a little bit of knee jerk, and often it's primary prevention. In other words, there are people who have not had obvious coronary symptoms yet, or vascular symptoms, uh, it's primary prevention. And uh, if, if that's mostly as a result of antiretroviral therapy, I mean, maybe we should be changing the antiretrovirals. But if they're working so well to suppress viral load, and patients are on a whole bunch of other medicines, you can see it's, it becomes kind of a complex pharmacologic problem that in geriatrics we call polypharmacy. So that certainly pertains to older people with HIV. But the jury's still out on statin therapy. I mean, maybe it's even better for people with long-standing HIV infection and hyperlipidemia than uninfected people. Just not, don't know yet. And we'd hate to be doing harm to people. I've certainly had patients with HIV who've had MIs at relatively young age. So. Maybe it's a very important thing to do, but it's something we should study, something we should look into, rather than just hauling off and doing it, thinking it's the right thing to do. So, a lot of commonalities in long-standing HIV infection, separate from the ones I've already told you. There's loss of bone and muscle mass. There's weight changes. I, the pictures of people I presented to you earlier show that there's changes in weight and body habitus that accrue. Uh, Decreases in glomerular filtration rate, renal changes, the memory loss I alluded to, any number of things that are now coming into consideration of taking care of older people with HIV. Including polypharmacy. I showed you the medical regimen of the patient I presented. Uh, as people age, they're accruing a substantial pill burden. So these are the number of non-HIV meds in older people and younger people with HIV, and you show, you see here an accrual of a whole lot of medicines that are outside of their antiretroviral regimen that people are having to juggle. So we're kind of back into worrying about pill burden in older people with HIV and interactions between antiretroviral medicines and their other commonly used medicines for other conditions. 
We worry about neurologic complications in our older people with HIV. HIV-associated dementia is about twice as common in HIV-infected people over age 50 than those who are younger, even after adjusting for a number of factors. But I see a lot of patients who may not meet the formal criteria for dementia, but have subtle cognitive changes that nevertheless harm their day-to-day -day existence. Uh, and that the incidence of that is growing as well, and that's poorly characterized. Even now in geriatrics, we're doing a lot of work on MCI, or mild cognitive impairment, kind of a pre-dementia type of uh, condition, and we probably should be doing that in people who have long-standing HIV infection. Lots of subtle changes that are not the same as in older people in their 80s and 90s without HIV, but nevertheless uh, should probably be characterized. And this is a paper by Victor Valcor, who is one of our panel members, who's working on that very thing. <clears throat> a number of endocrinologic abnormalities come up in older people with HIV. A substantial number of older HIV-infected men are testosterone deficient. Uh, and as a result, uh, become osteoporotic insidiously. And that's worsened if they have substance abuse or HCV infection. Uh, menopause occurs much earlier among women who are HIV infected than in those who are not infected. So, so that we worry about osteoporosis or becoming worried about it in older people with long-standing HIV infection. It's certainly the case that bone mineral density is lower in HIV infected, HIV infected persons uh, by age. So this is the odds of having low BMD relative to different ages, and you see that rise among older people with HIV in the gray bars there. And the, the fracture rate, it's not just the BMD, the fracture rate is in fact higher among HIV-infected men compared to uninfected men. So something else to worry about. And uh, I'll take a minute to just reflect on a number of psychosocial issues. Um, for the same reason that older individuals might do a better job of taking their antiretroviral therapy, uh, they may well have been alive during the early phase of the epidemic where a lot of their friends and associates died. They're older, so maybe their parents have died. So they've become a relatively socially and familially isolated over time and, and as a result lack social supports that a younger person with HIV might have a more, more robust infrastructure for. Uh, many of them have been on disability for some time, so they're running into financial issues before they're Social Security eligible. Uh, they may or may not have thought about advanced directives and power of attorney. D do some of you recognize this building? This is uh, on the corner of Madison and Broadway. The, in the early 90s, uh, the HIV clinic for Harborview was in this building. It's kind of a nondescript actually rather ugly uh, building on this corner. Uh, and it's actually a pretty big building, and the uh, HIV clinic and the AIDS clinical trials unit took up most of the first floor of this building in the early 90s. And, and what is actually kind of a nice place to practice. And what I remember about this uh, building in the early 90s is that to a person, almost every patient had their uh, durable power of attorney and advanced directives addressed. This was before antiretroviral therapy. And the case managers in Madison Clinic, bless their, bless their hearts, had done an excellent job of addressing that with every person. So that was quite routine to have patients have a durable power of attorney or at least have been asked about it and to have an advanced directive of some sort, which is something that we don't do much of anymore because antiretroviral therapy has been so effective that we don't think about it much anymore. I recently talked to people in Madison Clinic about that. By the way, that's why HIV Clinic is called Madison Clinic, as it's a holdover from having been in that building and as a way of not calling it HIV AIDS Clinic. It's still called Madison Clinic, even though it's on Harborview's campus. Anyway, little uh, HIV Seattle history there. Uh, so we do want to kind of work on advanced care planning. This was a study in, uh, that just appeared in the Journal of Palliative Medicine at the HIV clinic in Colorado, in Denver. And they did a study of 
it, did patients have a power of attorney and had, done, had they done advanced care planning? He had 238 subjects over a, a nice age spectrum, and they were very proud to report that almost half had an advanced directive. But, but they were the old guys. They were the people who probably got their advanced directive before antiretroviral therapy and still had one. So I think we probably need to bring that to the fore again in people particularly who have multimorbidity. It's not just the HIV, it's really everything else. For the patient I presented to you, HIV is kind of the least of his problems. It's his sleep apnea, his diabetes, his hyperlipidemia, et cetera, that I'm as much or more worried about. And for that very reason, it's worth at least thinking about advanced care planning for those kind of people. So we've been through a number of eras of the HIV epidemic. Uh, I was a resident in Chicago at the beginning of the epidemic, and it was, it was crisis management uh, thinking. We we're treating opportunistic illnesses and maybe not doing a very good job of that. But palliative care and primary care were a big part of care before the advent of antiretroviral therapy. And while practicing in Seattle, I was able to enjoy the onset of the antiretroviral era, where we did have effective therapy. Uh, and it was, it was a, a wonderful period to be practicing, a very hopeful period, and the, with the advent of the HIV specialists who could juggle antiretroviral <laughs> therapies. And now we're kind of in the chronic disease era where the, these comorbidities and the phenomenon of multimorbidity are starting to come more and more into the picture. And we're once again starting to think about how to best manage the multimorbidity phenomenon in HIV-infected people who are older. And coming kind of back around to the primary care part of it, trying to do both, trying to be holistic and manage all the conditions people have but at the same time to be reductionistic and assiduously managing their antiretroviral therapy to achieve the best outcomes possible in the context of people taking a whole lot of different medicines for which there may be drug-drug interactions. But we're now in a position to study some of the, these phenomena that occur in older people with HIV to try to do a better job of this, but it's a bit of a challenge for reasons I'll mention. Here, here's some of the things we need to study. We need to think about the high rates of comorbidities and parse out the underpinnings of the causes so that we might be able to address those a little bit better. Which ones are most important? And to what extent are they due to age, to long-standing HIV infection, or to the therapy for the HIV infection, even if effective? It is definitely difficult to co-manage all these conditions together, many of which are presumably not necessarily directly related to HIV, but may be a result of therapy or long-standing infection. What do we, what do, should we be giving statins to everybody as primary prevention when they're hypolipidemic after we start antiretroviral therapy? Maybe so, but maybe not. How about osteoporosis therapy? Should we be doing the same thing with our patients in their 50s and 60s who have very low bone mineral density that we might do in somebody who's in their mid-80s. Not so sure. A lot of people with HIV infection, or some anyway, have avascular necrosis phenomena. Uh, avascular necrosis of the hips, knees, etc. Uh, so it might be, it might be a difference. We, might, we should think about that carefully before we just knee-jerk and treat osteoporosis the same way we might in just older people who are not HIV infected. Uh, and part of this whole consensus panel work was to develop some recommendations or treatment strategies as at least a starting point to help manage older people with HIV. But the problem in studying these things is the cohort kind of doesn't exist yet. I, at the beginning of the talk, I pointed to that wave moving forward. Right now, there's some, but not a lot, of people with HIV infection who've been on therapy for a couple of decades who are in their 60s, say, give or take. There's this big wave of people in their mid-40s that we're trying to anticipate for, but you can't study them yet because they're not old yet. Uh, they're getting there, but it'll be the next decade, so we're trying to anticipate it without really people to study. One of the, one of the most rewarding things back at Madison Clinic uh, 
in the early 90s, the AIDS Clinical Trials Unit was right next to HIV Clinic, like it is today uh, at Harborview. And it, there were a lot of highly motivated, altruistic young people who were entering AIDS Clinical Trials, but that was pretty much the only thing that was wrong with them, HIV. They didn't have all these other comorbidities, which would make studying them today probably much harder. Uh, usually you like to really homogenize your cohort that you might study drugs in, in a randomized controlled trial. Here it's going to be a lot more varied and consequently complicated to study them, and they don't quite exist yet as a cohort. I mean, they're a cohort all right, it's just they're not old yet. So, some conclusions. Uh, HIV and AIDS in U.S. is increasingly an older population, but unlike early in the epidemic, where we weren't quite sure what was coming and weren't quite sure what to do about it, here you can kind of get your arms around the number of people. There's, there's tens of thousands, or maybe a, a, few, a couple of hundred thousand people who will age into HIV at the end of this decade and next decade, but not millions. I mean, maybe millions nationwide, but in the U.S., not millions. And in Seattle, maybe 10,000 or, you know, thousands of people, but not hundreds of thousands. So you can kind of, because HIV epidemiology is so good, you can get a pretty good idea of what's coming. And that might give us a better handle on how to manage it. But compared to younger people with HIV, older people with HIV have a better immune virologic response, but worse, immunologic response, and consequently shortened survival. Comorbid disease is becoming the main problem. And psychosocial issues are again coming to the fore. So this is, it, it was a, kind of a wonderful experience to be part of this consensus panel and see different opinions coming from people who are basically infectious disease background, <laughs> ID docs who've been highly excellent specialists in HIV management in particular, and the geriatric perspective. From the HIV side, we thought that early antiretroviral therapy was going to be the most important thing, but worry about the number of meds. From the geriatric side, worrying about comorbid disease and multimorbidity is, is important. And again, from HIV, already HIV specialists are noticing osteoporosis, this huge malignancy burden among older people with HIV, and cognitive changes that definitely need more study. And then from the geriatric side, we brought forward the, the psychosocial issues and the, and the advanced directives. So the recommendations I've summarized for you in the, in the handouts, and I have a kind of a summary slide of resources for you, but this, we had a number of fairly simple recommendations as a starting point to try to manage older people with HIV uh, as they age. And here are those resources for web references. I'd also like to draw your attention in, in the last page of the handout you have is an algorithm for managing people with multimorbidity, with or without HIV infection. It's a way to bite off chunks in taking care of people who have lots of comorbidity burden to address them in serial clinic visits in a good way so that you cover everything. It actually can be done if you bite it off in little chunks. It's a little, little kind of a mechanism or algorithm to get through a series of clinic visits and help manage people with multimorbidity effectively. I'm referring to that paper by Cynthia Boyd and others, many of whom did participate in the HIV consensus panel too. So here's this wave again of people moving forward in time. Right now, we're studying these right here, relatively few people, but here's what's coming after 2020. Again, not millions of people, just thousands. So we should be able to uh, manage this over time. And I look forward to that. With that, I'll end and take questions. Thank you. We don't have microphones, so I'll just repeat questions for people at Harborview and elsewhere if, if there are. You can also just make statements. You don't have to ask questions. Go ahead. Is there a recommendation for how to 
Sure. The, the, the question was, in, in the summary recommendations, you see that it's at least brought up as a possibility to actually stop antiretroviral therapy at some point. Uh, and that's, that's a realistic recognition of the fact that eventually multimorbidity can catch up with you. And that at some point, palliative approaches become appropriate. If people have a huge multimorbidity burden uh, and their HIV infection becomes perhaps the least important factor in caring for a person. That's primarily driven by a patient and family and their own autonomy. If people have been very burdened by taking lots of medicines and want to cut back on the medicines, you'll see as part of the algorithm uh, on the last page there of how to manage people with multimorbidity that it's perfectly reasonable to talk to people about balancing all the different medicines they're on and if there are a certain point in life where quality is much more important to them than quantity of life, it may be reasonable to think about cutting back or eliminating their antiretroviral regimen. If they're, uh, so for instance, I'm currently taking care of a patient at Bailey Boucher House <clears throat> who's morbidly obese, has uh, serious obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, that's going to be the reason he dies. Not his HIV infection, which is very well controlled. Uh, but he, A, refuses to wear a CPAP device, and B, hates taking a lot of medicines. Uh, so that's a, a reasonable scenario to consider stopping antiretroviral therapy. It probably would have little or no impact on his longevity. In fact, it may increase his longevity to not have to be taking a ton of medicines because his sleep apnea will, uh, without a doubt, lead to his de demise relatively soon. That's a, a bit of a stark example that just happens to be one from this week. But, uh, but grounded in a, in a real-life scenario. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. The question was, did the committee discuss uh, patients who had coexistent autoimmune or inflammatory diseases? And I'd have to, I'd have to say yes, but not very thoroughly. We brought up the fact that people with long-standing inflammatory diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus, for instance, or rheumatoid arthritis, also seem to have coronary artery disease and you know, problems that come up separate from their illnesses that are probably related to long-standing inflammation and that toning down that inflammation might help with these other comorbidities. But it was, it was in that tangential fashion that we addressed that. What, were you thinking about some other? I, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the statement was the thing about other illnesses that are clearly inflammatory as people's immune response recovers. No, we didn't really talk about that too much, nor did we really address uh, immune reconstitution syndrome, that is, people getting sick on antiretroviral therapy that is effective. Uh, and as their immune system uh, reconstitutes, they get ill. As, as a result. Uh, we didn't address that much. That's actually an interesting area. Do older people have immune reconstitution syndrome who are HIV infected and have a, and then are put on antiretroviral therapy at the same or lower rate or higher than younger people who have it fairly often? There was a really good study of immune reconstitution in the Annals of Internal Medicine in in 2012, but it was looking at, it, was, it wasn't so much by age, it was by condition like tuberculosis. I think it was a study done in, uh, South, in uh, South Africa. But that would be interesting to study too, whether immunoconstitution phenomenology 
is different in older people than in younger people. It would be good to know. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. The question was, uh, did we address on the panel the impact of older people who are HIV infected moving into retirement communities? We didn't address that so much at the panel, but it was a very uh, prominent part of the White House meeting on HIV and aging. A number of activists and different individuals were present at what was really a, a phenomenal day, uh, meeting in the Eisenhower building at the White House. And an older man who was HIV infected and had cancer, who actually was a very prominent individual, had moved into a retirement community and been kicked out which then resulted in some activism and more uh, and some legal action for that community, which had been an, a prominent phenomenon on the East Coast. Uh, so it was a it was uh, a big part of the White House Council, which is also available as some of these web resources if you'd like to look into it. But the panel didn't address it so much, but certainly a, a very interesting and important area. Another part of this kind of social, psychosocial impact of longstanding HIV infection that may be different from older people who are just aging. Great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>